Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone around the world participating today in the Green Swan Conference. I really hope you enjoyed the conference so far, and I'm very pleased to introduce our next special guest speaker and the first of the three Nobel laureates that will speak at this conference. Robert Engel is professor at finance at New York Stern School of Business. As many of you probably know, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his research on the concept of autoaggressive conditional heteroscedasticity. In other words, the modeling of time varying volatility. Professor Engel is currently the co-director of New York University Stern Volatility and Risk Institute and is co-founding president of the Society for Financial Econometrics. Amongst others, in 2019, he already published a very interesting research on the method for hedging portfolios against climate risk. Professor Engel, we are very honored to having you here today as a speaker, and we are very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on, on the financial approach to climate risk. Professor Engel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Irene. It's great to be with you today. It's great to have a uh, chance to join all the eminent speakers at this conference who it's is on a very important topic. And uh, I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about the research we're doing at, uh, at the Volatility and Risk Institute at, at NYU. Um, we've been uh, focused on new versions of risk and that's the topic for today. What is the risk? is posed to us by climate change. So let me um, share my screen so we can uh, talk about some uh, concrete uh, things that we want to do. So I want to talk about climate finance risk. I, I assume you can can see the screen, and um, it's it's great to be with you today. Obviously, this is a kind of a, a green slide. Um, so, what we know is that science has pretty much agreed that the world is warming. Economics is struggling to say exactly what the consequences of this will be, but we expect lower productivity population migration, stranded assets such as fossil fuels, and we haven't paid so much attention to this, but other stranded assets are likely to be capital and land. We can foresee global conflicts, reductions in the quality of life, and in the worst possible cases, the end of our species. But all of this is due to arrive a long time in the future, if at all. And Interestingly, however, in spite of the long horizon, we are seeing this already showing up in asset prices. And this is the reason for the conference here. Asset prices reflect forward-looking behavior. It reflects uh, long-term forecasts of cash flows. And so changes in the long-term prospects of cash flows and productivity affect asset prices today. And we are experiencing that and we want to know how to harness that, use it, measure the risk and, and proceed. So do financial markets really reflect climate risks and rewards? Basically, this is not a yes or no question. The question is, what is the market view on climate factors? I think the market does reflect climate factors, but perhaps it's more optimistic that they are going to be smaller than the scientific view. And so one of the things that we can expect as we go forward is that as the market learns and as science learns and as individuals learn more about the consequences of climate change, that's going to reprice assets and we expect our investment strategies and public policy should take into account the arrival of new information about climate change. It's well known by this audience that we often think about climate as having uh, at least two risks. One is the physical risk that we always talk about of warmer temperatures, rising sea levels, droughts, floods, and so forth. These are the 
really causes of the economic damage that we're focusing on. But a second risk is a risk that, in a sense, we create ourselves. That is, if we try to reduce the rate at which the climate is warming, we incur costs of transitions to a low carbon economy. And the rate at which this happens depends a lot on government and policy, and to some extent, financial sector. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Sometimes these risks reinforce each other and sometimes they go in the opposite direction. And as you can see, for example, when the US pulled out of the Paris Agreement, it actually reduced our transition risk, but it increased physical risk. And but other, other kinds of news events make them both increase, like scientific evidence that the climate is changing faster than people expected makes both risks go up. So two general solutions are being discussed all the time. One is adaptation. This is relatively uncontroversial because this says that individuals and governments and corporations should actually optimally respond to the climate change that we see. Uh, adaptation is not controversial because it corresponds exactly to standard economic and cost benefit analysis. What's the costs and benefits of changing to respond to climate change? It is still not widely applied because I think the, the view is that maybe uh, we don't have to do this yet. Uh, but I think the answer is that we do have to do it now. But the second solution, of course, is mitigation, which is to try to do something to slow the rate of climate change. And this is actually something that, that firms and governments and individuals have to somehow collectively reduce emissions and therefore reduce damages. So it's controversial. It creates winners and losers, costs and benefits. And that's a key topic for uh, any kind of climate uh, policy. So what do investors do faced with this dilemma? Some investors invest for impact. Some invest for charitable, what I might call planetary goals. And some invest to hedge climate risk. And this is the objective I'd like to talk about today, which is can you form an investment portfolio that will especially do especially well if the climate is worse than the market thinks it's going to be? The advantage of this is it gives you some insurance that if the climate turns out to be worse than we expected, your portfolio will actually outperform. It also has the benefit that it makes the cost of capital lower for companies that are prepared for climate change and higher for companies that are not prepared or resisting climate change. So it, it works in, this, in the direction that you might think, but it's a fairly uh, uh, clear objective function for forming a portfolio. So what does asset pricing theory tell us about this kind of climate hedge portfolio? Well, first of all, climate risk is a pervasive factor. It's probably underpriced and probably not included in most asset pricing models. And firms that are exposed to climate risk should be therefore less desirable because they're riskier. A less desirable asset would have a lower price in equilibrium. And Bolton and Kaspersick show that this is in fact true, that, that that uh, assets which are exposed, more exposed to climate change do trade at a lower price. But the consequence of a lower price is that the returns actually are higher. That is, in order to induce investors to hold these risky assets, you have to give them a higher risk premium and higher expected returns. And so investors willing to bear this risk actually can expect higher uh, returns. 
And by the same token, investors who want to insure against this risk will expect to have lower expected returns and we say a negative risk premium. So the alpha of a climate hedge portfolio would generally be negative. This is sort of pessimistic information for people who are following this kind of investment strategy. And it may be a hard sell for portfolio managers who recognize this. But there is another side to this, which is important, which is how does the market learn about climate change? Well, if there's news that the climate change is going to be more severe than the market expects, and this might include a lot of news about climate change because the market is perhaps underpricing it, then climate hedge portfolios will actually rise in value because both the long and the short positions would likely appreciate. So if the climate ultimately turns out to be worse than we, the market currently expects it to be, then these portfolios would have accumulation of appreciations, which would more than offset these negative alphas. And consequently, the, the basic idea is when there is little climate news, you might expect negative risk premiums in the market. When there is a lot of news, you might expect assets would be repriced and these hedge portfolios should have a positive alpha. And this gives us a way of determining the effectiveness of a hedge portfolio and how to design them in the first place. So what are the strategies to design them? Well, one strategy is to do fundamental analysis, combine ESG data with financial data to form portfolios. Here was exactly where we wish we had better disclosure, so we had better ESG data. Even if we had great ESG data, it's still not exactly clear how to form these kinds of portfolios. There are some assets which actually are very closely tied to climate change. And uh, I think a good example of this is carbon emission certificates, the, the certificate to allow you to pollute with CO2. These are priced in a way that should reflect the seriousness of climate change. And now market has created an index of these global emission certificates. And KRBN is an ETF which trades these things. And I'm happy to say that the Volatility and Risk Institute has helped in bringing KRBN to market. And it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to look at. The other approach is to be statistical, to look when there is news about climate change, which assets go up and which assets go down. Can you hold these going forward and therefore capture the eventual uh, climate change that comes from the news? Okay, how do we construct portfolios? Well, maybe it's a long uphill trek. Uh, and work with uh, Stefano Giglio, Brian Kelly, Kibum Lee, and Johannes Strobel. We sought portfolios in a uh, RFS paper that go up exactly as I said, when there is bad climate news and short stocks that go down on this news. We create factor mimicking portfolios based on news series which are extracted from a textual analysis of the Wall Street Journal. This is a uh, an interesting strategy for creating these kinds of statistical portfolios. But there are lots and lots of alternative funds out there. In fact, Wall Street is falling all over itself to produce sustainable climate-oriented portfolios for investors. And they're trying to form, find portfolios that do what I say. So how successful are these portfolios? Well. If you look uh, a little more than a year ago, in 2019, that one-year, three-year, five-year, exponentially weighted and max weighted, max time, different categories, looking at the alpha, you see these alphas on average are really negative in almost all these categories. However, if you look today, you see, at least for the short horizon, the alphas are positive. So this is 
corresponds to my news story, that we're seeing a lot more climate awareness, I think, now. And I think the market is presumably responding to that and pricing, at least in the short run, these alphas with positive uh, values, even though the longer horizon alphas are negative. This is a box which gets updated every day on uh, VLAB. And so you, if you go to this website, you'll be able to see exactly this table. And this, is, this was I did yesterday. So uh, it's changing all the time. So what we really would like to do would be to form climate hedge portfolios and um, use these to price uh, assets. So one that has been proposed by Bob Litterman is a stranded asset portfolio. It's basically long the uh, S&P and short an ETF on coal firms and short uh, the rest of the uh, energy sector, XLE. But this turns out, of course, not to be sufficient to price all climate assets because it doesn't include uh, it doesn't include physical risk particularly and may not include a lot of other factors that are important in climate analysis. So we have uh, put a, created another factor mimicking portfolio in work with uh, John Luca Denard and Brian Kelly and myself, which actually starts with the best of Wall Street. It looks at the uh, portfolios of publicly available climate funds, the same ones that are in this table, but it creates dynamic portfolios. They're long only portfolios. They're designed to minimize the variance, but maximize the correlation with climate news after taking out the effect of standard investment factors and the standard asset portfolio. You hold this portfolio for one month and then recalculate. So. What do we get when we do something like this? Well, we get a portfolio and we're going to look at out of sample performance of this portfolio. And here is the, here are the factors, the three Fama French factors, the stranded asset portfolio, and here's an oil return. And this is the news series that we're using. And you see it has a coefficient, which is really quite significant in uh, the period of 2000 in one to 2021. If you look at the alpha of this portfolio, then we replace the news with a constant term and we see that's significant and positive. So this is a positive alpha over the sample period. Its uh, annualized value is about six. However, it turns out if you look at the performance of this portfolio in 2020, it has an alpha of almost 70% and the stranded asset portfolio had an alpha of almost 30%. So these results complement industry research by Morningstar, BlackRock, and others that suggest that climate sensitive portfolios did extremely well in 2020. That is, the pandemic was actually a good time for climate hedge portfolios, surprisingly. Why is that? Well, for one thing, there is a close similarity between the effects of climate change and the effects of COVID-19. One way to say this is we saw transition risk occurring, transition risk in action as people stopped commuting, as uh, stopped flying so much, as the use of fossil fuels collapsed and the price collapsed even more because of the supply uh, by uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia competing for uh, market share. So we have winners, which is the technology sector that it helped us provide goods and services and transportation without uh, using so much fossil fuels. And in addition, we seem to have a fair amount of physical risk. If you want to think about how big a transition is this, ask yourself, what kind of carbon tax would it take to get everybody locked down? It would be 
astronomical in price. So we, are, we have witnessed transition risk at a rate which is more extreme than any kind of policy uh, that has been proposed. If you look at just sector results, you can also see this. You can see in 2020, the worst return was by the energy sector and the best return was by technology. In fact, for the volatility of, uh, of 2020 was highest for the energy sector. So it had the lowest return and the highest volatility. That's what we're talking about here. It also has the highest volatility this year, but it has a positive return. But if you look back over the past, you see it has uh, lowest return, highest volatility, lowest return, almost highest volatility. And if you go back even further, look how much red there is here in the XLE row. It's got the lowest return and the highest volatility in most of the last, uh, what, seven years, I guess. So it's not like transition risk just happened a year ago. It's been going on. And we are seeing the repricing of these, uh, these energy assets. What do we use these climate factors for? Well, we could invest in them directly. We could invest in portfolios that have a high beta on these funds to achieve similar performance. We can measure the risk of climate change by looking at the volatility of these hedge portfolios. It tells you how fast they're moving and we can use them to stress test banks by examining the impact of movements in these hedge portfolios. Let me show you uh, two things. I wanna show you, first of all, the volatility of this hedge portfolio, this factor mimic mimicking portfolio that we did. And I'm using a Gartz model for this, which gives you a way of measuring the volatility over time. And since the volatility is the volatility of the new information about climate, uh, you can see it goes up and down over time. But most dramatically, it's been rising at the end. So we see that the climate change is happening faster now than it has over the last two decades. And we see this, this is an elevated risk and maybe it's an elevated awareness of risk, but in any case, it is elevated in this portfolio. The final thing I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, is stress tests. Why should central banks do stress tests? Because banks, large banks, hold a lot of climate sensitive assets and they may have taking more risk than they think, in other words, risk management may not effectively be predicting climate risks. So that actually is a lot like what happened when the financial crisis, when they didn't accurately predict the risk of mortgages. But more than that, if many banks are exposed, even if they did good individual good risk management, then there's the potential for systemic risk and another financial crisis. And then finally, if we expect government to do policies that are gonna mitigate climate change, if these policies that mitigate climate change actually impact the fossil fuel sector as we would expect, we don't want the policy to be causing a financial crisis. So you don't want the banks to be arguing against mitigation policy because their portfolios are, are too exposed. How are we gonna do this? We're going to try to look at a climate beta for the bank stocks. And we're going to allow this climate beta to change over time, just as we allowed the factor mimicking portfolio to change over time. And we're going to calculate a measure of capital shortfall, which we call C-risk for climate risk, which is done the same sort of way we do S-risk for systemic risk due to uh, market failures. Here's the stress we're going to look at. We're going to look at the stranded asset portfolio. And this is the, a picture of the six month return of this portfolio with US election. Here, here's uh, Biden, Trump, uh, Obama, and Bush are our four presidents that have presided over the last 20 years. And what we're going to look at is what is the 
worst case that we saw over this period. And let's look at something which is roughly 1% of the, of the downturn of this uh, stranded asset portfolio. We're going to regress market returns for the return stock returns for the uh, large investment banks on a market return and on this climate factor and get a beta which is time varying it's time varying because volatilities are varying correlations are varying and in general betas are varying and here's what you see if you look at all the u.s banks here is zero so the beta is actually negative for a lot of this period but especially at the end of the sample, it's really been rising in the US. If you look at the same thing in the UK, you see zero is down here, and the betas are positive for most of the sample period, and there is some dispersion of them, which should depend on their holdings of climate sensitive results, if the, at least if the market is uh, sufficiently aware of uh, what the banks are holding. And here is the same thing for France. We're doing this for uh, financial institutions all over the world, and pretty soon you'll be able to see this on VLAB, just like you see uh, S-Risk on VLAB. If you look at the holdings of the U.S. banks and you relate them at the end of the sample, the holdings at the end of the sample period, and you relate them to the um, climate beta, you see the climate betas are higher when there are more active uh, gas and oil company uh, loans on their uh, their books. How big are these numbers? Well, I could show you the, the C-risk numbers, but I'm just going to show you two examples. The highest one in, in France is uh, BNP Paribas, and here is the S-risk for BNP Paribas over time, and here's what the C-risk is today. So it's actually bigger than the, uh, than the S-risk. If you look at uh, the most exposed Bank in England, it's Barclays, and again, the C risk is higher than the S risk today. So, this is an issue that from this methodology uh, looks like it's important. Central banks all over the world are trying to figure out how to do this, and uh, I think this kind of market based uh, stress test is a potentially an interesting. Uh, alternative approach or uh, complementary approach to understanding the risks that banks face. So in conclusion, we have shown strategies for more efficient portfolios and climate stress tests. But I'd like to ask the question, is it enough? Is it enough to do more efficient strategies for investment portfolios and for climate stress tests and all the other things that we're talking about today in climate finance. And I think the answer is most of what we're talking about is really adaptation. How do we get risk managers and banks and regulators to adapt to what we think of as the risks, the real risks of climate change? But that doesn't give us the mitigation that we're likely to need. It doesn't give us a way of dealing with free riders who are going to pollute and not uh, contribute to the transition. It doesn't give us a way of having assets priced based on the fundamental risks rather than just the, uh, the risks without taking into account of climate emissions. So I think there are lots of initiatives that can be put in place here, but it's important to recognize that what we're doing, what I'm talking about here is adaptation, and it is a very important part of adjusting to climate change, but it's only the first step. We have to do the mitigation too. So I think unless financial markets effectively, uh, the financial markets will effectively mitigate climate change only if we have the price or regulation of carbon so that the risk and return are correlated uh, are, are corrected for emission externalities so 
we need to give the proper signals to the market and then let the financial sector do its magic. And that's what I hope will come out of various policy decisions and regulatory decisions that are made going forward. Uh, I think the net zero is part of this. When I say effectively uh, price or regulate carbon, I think that the, the net zero in initiatives are important ways to uh, regulate carbon emissions. It produces a shadow price of carbon, but it's not the same as actually a tax. So here are my three of my grandsons looking out over this peaceful lake that we started with, but they're worried. What's in their future? And if we can tell them that both these problems, adaptation and mitigation are solved, they'll be very happy. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor Engel. And what a beautiful picture to end your presentation with. And also, for it, it's been so insightful to see already the impact of climate news on portfolios and how the risks are elevating already. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's been very inspiring. I have one last question I ask every uh, participant uh, or speaker, and that is, I think you summarized it already, but what would be uh, the one thing that we need to do next to coordinate the fight against climate change? I think that the governments are committing voluntarily through the Paris Court and, and, and the upcoming COP, but governments need to be able to enforce their their uh, objectives and I think we are going to see necessary uh, net zero race to net zero commitments I think voluntary is not going to be enough I want to see uh, the governments all over the world enforcing uh, net zero requirements paths to net zero and uh, I think it's I think it's a, a a time when there is a lot of enthusiasm for doing this, and I think it might be an easier uh, sell to the public sector than uh, than selling a tax. So that's my uh, first step. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Engel, for for being with us today, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about your work in the future and also about the V Labs work. Uh, uh, I'm. Uh, about to announce to that uh, we'll end this session and uh, the other session with uh, Mr. Al Gore will start in a few minutes. So I hope to see you back. Thanks again, uh, Professor Engel. Thank you.